Hey there, how are you all doing? Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani, the Total Connector. Um, there's a, yeah, there's a brilliant author out there. His name is Gael Sanchez Smith, and he's an Austrian economist, Bitcoin economist. Um, he's doing his master's in Austrian economics, and I really appreciate, you know, uh, uh, for taking his time. He's, so um, he wrote an article that's called once inflation starts it won't be contained that's one of his you know one of his latest articles so he talks about you know inflation the high levels of public and private debt and that the, you know that the governments and the central banks are sort of you know trapped you know in this in this in this in this really bad cycle and they can't get out of it because they would unleash a you know, social economic and political crisis and they can't even you know raise the interest rates because that would cause household and corporate defaults that would result in financial crisis and a depression that beyond our imagination and uh, yeah and the government would be then forced as is as uh, gail says in his article to balance the budget imposing severe austerity that would lead to intergenerational social conflict so bunch of topics bunch of uh, uh questions uh, we're going to discuss uh bitcoin you know, uh, inflation, deflation, def, uh, def, uh, you know, the, the future of hum humanity. And uh, uh, if you have any questions afterwards or any input, let me know. I'm really looking forward to that further ado. This is my talk with Gael Sanchez-Smith. I uh, hope you're going to love it as much as I do. And talk to you soon. Thanks. Welcome to the show. My very special guest is Gael Sanchez Smith, and uh, Gael, thank you so much for coming to my show. How are you doing? Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, it's a pleasure. Big fan of the show, so it's great, great to be here. Yeah, I can always say the same. Listen, I mean, I I, I read your article. Um, I didn't read all your articles, but the last one uh, or one of the your last ones, um, it's uh, called um, "Once Inflation." starts it won't be contained and that's from june 12th uh, you you already I mean published us um maybe one or two other articles i think in september right um yeah yeah that, that was uh, i think it was my first i, I wrote a couple of uh, articles in uh, spanish before that but that was my first uh, article in english and um, yeah i really enjoyed writing it up um I'm actually uh, finishing a, a master's in Austrian economics. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Okay, finally someone, yeah. <laughs> you know, master. I mean, because we've never been taught Austrian economics and it's like so suppressed in the university. So. Yeah. It's funny how you have to go to Spain to study Austrian economics. Apparently it's harder in Austria than in Spain. But we, we actually have uh, two masters in Spain. Uh, one of them is online and the other one is um, is, is um, in person with Jesus Huerta del Soto. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I read his book. I read his book. Isn't that like yeah. money, credit, bank, something like like uh, cycle, something like that? It was like a huge, uh, like a thick book. Yeah, 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 yeah. well regarded. And he runs a master's uh, uh, in, in person in Madrid. And I did one online with Juan Ramon Rayo. He's another Spanish Austrian economist. He's, mm -hmm. he's actually a disciple of Jesus Huerta del Soto, but he took Austrian economics and merged it a bit with, um, he calls it liquidity theory. So the work of uh, Antal Fekete, a, a Hungarian economist. So um, it's you. been good. It's been good. And, and the article is, uh, is heavily influenced by what I've been uh, taught uh, during the masters. Mm -hmm. I, I have the impression that somehow, I don't know, is it the Sp Spanish sc scholars or, or, or um, economists? There are more like, you know, I don't know, they found out, you know, into the rabbit hole of Austrian economics more than other scholars from other countries. Could that be? Because, you yeah. know, the Soto, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems it's, it's quite a, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, I wonder why, because I think it's probably Jesus who uh, he, he's, you know, he's very well regarded. Uh, and uh, I think he started this master's in Madrid and a lot of people have gone through it. And then they've kind of uh, given Austrian economics a bit more of a voice. But it's, yeah, it's really big. Especially in the investment community in Spain, uh, Austrian economics is, we is well read. Uh, yeah, probably more so than in other countries. 
Yeah, great. So let's talk about your article. You know what I love about your article is you tied in everything together with with Jeff Foos. You know his book. Uh, probably you've, you've obviously read his book. You know the Price of Tomorrow: Why Deflation is the Cue to an Abundant Future. You quoted you know all our friends. You know like Ben Kaufman and and Stephanie von von Jahn. I mean they're all brilliant minds. You know would it be like explaining the root causes? You know would it be central banking system, uh, the the boom and bust cycles by Ben Kaufman? So you know. I give you the stage, uh, Gael, why don't you just tell uh, my listeners, like, what are the key points that you wanted to emphasize or bring through, you know? Uh, I know it's uh, one issue that I love about what you talked about is like the breach of trust, you know? That's why I took that title for the for, for our episode, you know? Like, yeah. uh, it seems like, you know, governments and central banks don't want to learn out of history. I mean, it's, it's more than conspicuous now, but, uh, is that a trust issue we have, like generally in society as well as in the monetary, you know, uh, uh, field? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the article has been influenced by Ben and Stephanie, Emil also, who's been on your show. And I think the, the three of them are brilliant. And uh, essentially, I think the main thesis of the article is that uh, in the event of inflation, central banks are going to have a lot of trouble containing it, preserving the value of fiat currencies. So there is an element of trust because uh, in a sense, like the whole system is predicated upon people trusting it. I mean, the, the fiat currency system. So uh, yeah, I mean, the article doesn't um, propose that inflation is an imminent threat. It doesn't, it doesn't claim that we're gonna get hyperinflation next month or even next year, but it does say that in the event of inflation, central banks are, are gonna have a, a big trouble con uh, containing it and preserving the value of the currency. And that, and uh, yeah, I go into the reasons why I believe uh, that is the case. And um, yeah, I, th I think trust trust is a, is a big thing because in a way, fiat currencies, uh, if, if like in a way, in a sense, the value of them are based on expectation. So if we expect that the currency is going to preserve its value, then we will be happy keeping it in our cash balance or in a bank account or or wherever. But if if we're not sure about that, if we don't have a the, the assurance that they're going to be able to preserve it, then, then we're in big trouble and the currency is, is in big trouble. So I think, yeah, I think that's the main uh, thesis of the article. Um, and we can go into like the reasons why I believe so. Um, I, try, I try to start out the article with a, with a theory of the value of fiat currencies, which is a bit different maybe from the Austrian mainstream line. It's a bit different from Jesus Huerta de Soto and, and other Austrian thinkers in a sense. And it's also, it's also very different from the Keynesian and the Chartalist point of view, obviously. Um, because I think they both take a bit more of an objective theory of the value of fiat currency. So, for instance, if you ask an Austrian, they would say that any increase in the quantity of money is going to lead to inflation. Or Austrians, not all Austrians, but many have tended to, to pose that that's the case. And a lot of them have, a lot of them have been wrong, especially after 2009. We've got quantitative easing. Uh, a lot of uh, economists, Austrians and otherwise, were kind of uh, bracing for hyperinflation. They were warning everyone there's going to be big inflation and it didn't really happen. It didn't occur, at least in the, in the CPI. So uh, that, on the one hand, Austrians, I think they put a lot of emphasis on the quantity of money. They believe that if it increases, then we're going to get inflation. Whereas uh, the Chartalists believe that the state can decree the value of the currency. So they tend to claim that well, if the state says that this is money, then this will be money. And uh, the article proposes that they're, they're both wrong. Obviously, the Chartalists are uh, less closer to the truth than, than the Austrians. But what, what, I, what, I, uh, what I propose is that actually the value of fiat currencies is like any other asset. It, it is subjective. Like uh, Menga and, and, uh, and the original Austrians used to emphasize value is always subjective. And, and it's no different for fiat currencies than for oranges or for, or for stocks. So the article uh, proposes that actually the, fiat, the value of fiat currencies is based on supply and demand. And, and, and we need both. We don't, it's not just the supply side, so the quantity side, but it's also the demand side that, that matters a lot. So I think that's the first stepping stone uh, of, of, of my article, yeah. Yeah, before we go on to, uh, go on to this, uh, other points, um, let's just, you know, just stand still for a moment and, and, and I want to ask you, uh, since you know, the dollar, US dollar is the international reserve currency, the global, you know, reserve currency, and it's responsible or, or 
it's demanded, right, by the global trade. How much, how much, you know, of a factor is that? Like, we're talking about like the global trade volume of whatever, 70, 80 trillion. Like, is that like, is that one of the primary reasons the demand is so strong yeah. or, or because it's, it's gonna, you know, procrastinate it uh, uh, until whatever we see some kind of potential inf real inflation, like, like high inflation. That's a really good point because but yeah, like you say, the US dollar is different from, from other fiat currencies in that it has more demand. It has demand for international trade. Also, the oil market, which is the largest market out there, is priced in US dollars. So if you want to buy a barrel of oil, you need dollars. Or at least things are starting to change in that regard. But up till now, it was like that. So that, that's definitely a source of demand. But we can think of other sources like the coronavirus crisis, for instance. Everyone's at home and you're holding to your cash. You're, you're demanding cash. You're not spending it. So that's also a source of money demand that, that could dampen inflation. Let's say if, if the supply of money increases, but uh, the, the people are still spending the same amount of money or more, then you would expect uh, prices to go up. But since people are locked down, they can't really spend much. That's another source of, of demand for, for cash balances. Um, so yeah, I think, I think you're right. And, and it actually, what it, I think what it actually says is that if the dollar is in trouble, then we can expect pretty much every other currency to, to be in a bigger trouble than the dollar because they have uh, less demand for, like you say, for international trade and other, and other commodity markets. Uh, you probably have heard of, uh, I've, ha I've had him on my show, I'm probably going to have him again, maybe together with Stephanie von Jan, uh, Dr. Markus Kral, Markus Kral, uh, uh, Torsten Polite, you know, these Austrian economists, but especially Markus Kral is still like, you know, on the extreme side, he's, he sees like uh, total like insolvency waves coming in Europe and uh, European Union. So that he sees, I mean, he, he prognosticizes that, you know, the euro is going to crash by 2021. So, but that's, you know, his assessment, I mean, can, can you explain, like, can you relate to the, 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 the euro like because if anything happens it's going to first happen in the european union right yeah yeah you, do you mean in regards to the to inflation risks or uh insolvencies inflation okay. over debtness you know i mean he calls yeah. it like you know simirage capital is going to be like used up or something i don't know what's his you know precise definition is that simirage like rent seeking capital probably by the central bank so uh, he, he he relates that to the GDP, so I'm not sure how he defines that. But uh, if anything happens, I think we're gonna first see it in the European Union. That's my point. You know? Yeah, I think I can I can see more risks, political risks in the European Union. Definitely. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I think lately there's been some agreement uh, about debt debt utilization, but I think. Uh, yeah, the, the political risks are definitely higher. I think the banking system in, in Europe is a lot weaker, especially because of negative interest rates, which are undercapitalizing the banking sector. We can see that in Spain, like Spanish banks are just, they're just crushing. They're going through the floor. Uh, all the stocks are going down and, and the outlook is very negative in Spain and Italy. And I think the banking, European banking system overall, that's pro probably because of negative interest rates, which we haven't seen so far in the US. And regarding the more macroeconomic variables, well, if you look at the debt, debt to GDP, the European Union is slightly below the US and the deficit is also slightly below. So I see uh, maybe uh, from a macroeconomic standpoint, I, I see uh, the US in a weaker position, at least for now, when it comes to the fiscal position, the deficit and, and the debt. And the EU has lot big uh, political, uh, yeah, political challenges ahead. And, and the banking system, I think, is also like a big, it's a big problem. Uh, and that's without going to mention the, you know, the, the dynamics of, of the markets in Europe, which is obviously there's less innovation, there's more barriers to competition and to trade, which is a bigger advantage in the US. But just looking at the macroeconomics, uh, I'm not entirely sure which would be the weakest horse I would bet, bet against if the dollar or the euro. Uh, it would be a very difficult trade for me. I, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not quite sure uh, which side I could go. Um, what about the, this this uh, whole discussion? I mean, it's this is I see more the imminent uh, threat, but it's somehow they're trying, I think, to prepare the ground for that. You know, for the central bank digital currency. Uh, w where do you see the the reset phase for that? I mean, you know, I mean, when we're talking about central bank digital currency, that means centralized, uh, monopolized, you know, socialized, uh, total like cashless society. 
is yeah. that is that a danger you see in in generally in European Union? I mean, yeah, yeah I, th I, th I think that's a big threat towards imminent, uh, like imminent, or do you see that like in 10, 20 years coming? Or? I don't think it's imminent because Germany is uh, strongly opposed. German, the German culture is, is favors cash and it's quite conservative from a monetary standpoint. You know, mm -hmm. they're they're always worried about these uh, uh, measures that the ECB is taking, and, and I don't see that as something being imminent. But Spain, the Spanish PM, Prime Minister, the President has been pushing for this in a reckless manner, and uh, it's, it was actually the ECB, I think, that had to say, look, like you can't just ban cash. It's, it's against the you know the, the the laws or the norms of the European Union. So the, the, there's a wide range of opinions, but I, I don't see it as an imminent threat. I do see it as a big problem going ahead. But luckily, we have we have Bitcoin, uh, which is definitely is going to become uh, more important than ever. Well, because as as you've discussed, I think in your own show, like it, when we have digital currencies and we have a bank account with the central bank, they can impose negative rates that go down to whatever yeah. five, seven, ten percent per annum effectively uh, yeah just pillaging people's savings uh, making you consume making you invest even when the circumstances don't favor it or, or you just don't like it or maybe just against your own will so it's just another form of taxation and very dangerous uh, yeah it threatens our liberties and it threatens our economy too so uh I it's a it's form a... of dictatorship i mean it's systematic yeah. it's just a systematic bail-in then you know what we've had you know in 2013-14 in in, in Cyprus, I mean, that was peanuts probably. So yeah. with a central bank digital currency, I mean, this is this is like, uh, I mean, I see a huge, huge dan danger, you know, of, of, of uh, this is a form of, uh, of, of oppression that we've never had probably in, in, in you know, in history. Yeah, yeah, I think, and, and, and the fact that they can monitor every one of our transactions is just, uh -huh. uh, yeah, it's very scary. And, and, and on the other hand, I, Fiscal policy and monetary policy are going to become two sides of the same coin because they can use the currency to tax us. It's, it's just the same thing. It's a more convenient way of taxation, uh, unless, unless there's alternatives, which, which luckily people are working on. Uh, and I know Bitcoin right now is not feasible as, as a monetary alternative due to the high fees. But let's hope that uh, the engineers uh, keep working hard and, and we have a yeah we, we have an alternative system which can't be controlled by bureaucrats or it's. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an important mission ahead for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you wrote somewhere in your article, you know, the the trust of the investors. I don't know wh wh what's, what what did you think when you when you wrote that 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 line that the trust of the investors. You mean also like, you know, companies like you know when we're talking about like Michael Saylor of of MicroStrategy. Do you, I mean, this is not going to be like a one-time example i think there's a lot of discussions going on right now in the boardrooms in the back back rooms of the boardrooms yeah. uh do you see that like unexpectedly uh, exponentially rising uh, you know those kind of cases where where board members or the the board of those companies decide to uh you know put their excess whatever cash reserves or, or treasury reserves into like bitcoin yeah, yeah, I, th I think with trust, investor trust. I'm actually I'm considering uh, fiat currencies like like a financial asset. So I think of us as investors when we choose to hold fiat, we are actually in a sense we're holding another asset which has a counterparty risk, maybe not nominal counter counterparty risk, but but a very real counterpart counterparty risk in the sense that. We don't know how much it's going to buy tomorrow and that's all that matters that like, we don't want pieces of paper we, we i mean i'm not interested in having a thousand euros i want to know what what's the buying power of, the, of those thousand euros and yeah. michael Saylor obviously has reached the same conclusion and he seems to think that it's not going to be much in the future that's why he's uh, with regards to the dollar he's converted it into bitcoin and, and I, I do think that that's that's going to be a trend in the in the coming yeah in the coming future i was surprised at the the magnitude of, of the purchase because yeah. it's going it's to fluctuate a lot, so I would presume it's going to be more of a, of a gradual kind of a, a gradual shift. And as Bitcoin gains adoption, it, it, it grows its market cap and it becomes more stable. I would say then it, it, it might even become the preferred uh, cash cash balance asset uh, in in the coming years. But I think we're still quite far 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 away from that because it's such a volatile instrument that uh, I don't see large companies holding a large percentage of the of their, of their uh, yeah, cash reserves for now, but I think it's definitely going to become a trend. I see it more in individuals. You know, if individuals are more sovereign, you don't have to 
uh, reports to the board of directors every month or every three months. So I think the yeah, I think the impulse is going to come, keep coming from from individual investors. Mm -hmm. Like you mean not only like average like individual, but also like ultra net high worth individuals, family offices maybe. You yeah. Know? yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, family offices. Yeah, yeah, large well wealthy uh, holders of other assets who are going to see Bitcoin as as a good alternative. Yeah, for sure. Do you do you th do you think because we have we've heard this statement? I don't know from all kinds of hedge fund managers, even from Michael Saylor or Jeff Foos. Uh, he says you know it's it's actually you know pretty irresponsible not to hold a certain percentage of your wealth in Bitcoin. What, what's, what do you think about this? I mean, you know, all these statements, I mean, have you heard, like, listen all to, to also some interviews of Michael Saylor and others, or My, Michael, or what is, what's his name, Paul Tudor Jones, and uh, do you think this is accelerating? Yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, people don't seem to see it uh, so far, but I think it's, it's uh kind of a change of, of the perspective when you when you look at it that way you think to yourself actually it's so reckless not holding any bitcoin is probably the most reckless decision you can make right now not holding like even a small percentage of your wealth uh yeah it's incredibly reckless because of what we were talking about before because if you hold fiat currencies you don't know what's going to be their buying power in a, in a month you don't even know if the banking system like we were saying it's been so damaged and it's still being completely eaten away by negative interest rates we don't know if our cash is going to be readily available in the future. If you have 10,000 euros in your account, well, if the bank is in trouble, it, it doesn't have your 10,000 euros. It's a promise to pay you 10,000 euros. And if they don't have it, well, they're going to do what they always did. They're going to say, no, look, we're going to give it to you maybe in a month, maybe in three, maybe in a year, maybe in three years. And in that time, we don't know how much that 1,000 euros is going, to, is going to be worth. And some, something we were talking about the EU before, something I don't, really consider to be outlandish at all is to consider to think that maybe if the banking system keeps getting into trouble and becomes decapitalized especially with this covid cut crisis so so many loans are going to be underperforming and they're going to be wiped out from the balance from the from the balance sheet we could see some form of soft capital controls in the european banking system i don't think this is going to happen tomorrow but i think it's something p perfectly possible i mean i'm quite familiar with the case of argentina and there weren't many warnings when, when they had the Coralito there and they couldn't access their, their deposits. Something that, yeah, we don't really think about it enough is our bank deposits. We are giving the, the ownership of the cash to the bank. bank. The cash is not there. The bank doesn't hold it. It's, it's actually using it to, to leverage up and to give out loans. And, and we've seen so many of these loans going underwater that I, I would say given given the circumstances not having any bitcoin any any bitcoin is a real asset isn't it it's no one's there's no one's it hasn't doesn't have any counterparty risk uh, if you own bitcoin no one needs to give you anything in return you just have your bitcoin you have your keys and not having a real asset that is no what nobody else is liability today in this environment i think is a very reckless decision yeah mm -hmm. um you know we've heard about um also fiduciary responsibilities so, you know, because I found it funny when, when uh, Michael Saylor, um, you know, told the story, like, like how this decision making process took place in, in the boardroom. And then he found out that half of the board members, they had already invested into Bitcoin, you know, and he didn't know that. So <laughs> well, it's, it, at least it's, it seemed like the, the way he told, he told the story, they, you know, he didn't know. So do you think there is sort of a, 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 a sort of a regulatory or or uh, you know internal obstruction like hindrance to to make these kind of decisions like are, are maybe a decision makers you know in those whatever you could be even in pension funds you know or family offices pension funds or you know especially pension funds who are sitting globally i don't know on how much 50 60 70 trillion dollars worth uh, uh you know um do, do, do you think some decision makers are waiting for that moment where they can at least you know where they're free where they're free to make those kind of decisions you know put at least whatever five ten twenty percent uh yeah into bitcoin yeah yeah i think with michael saylor as i understand he's the majority shareholder so mm -hmm. he could yeah he could unanimously almost make that decision but most companies have a yeah like a the board an executive board they have a shareholder meetings so that's a hindrance, but but then again, if you know, if if we start to see inflation, 
then I'm sure uh, no one is going to oppose to having some of the cash in a hard asset that, that can't be inflated. And regarding the regulations, uh, yeah, that's something that uh, I haven't looked into in depth, but I presume that pension funds have some limitations towards where, yeah. where, whether they can invest into Bitcoin yet. And I, I, would, I would assume that once uh, the, the market cap grows, Bitcoin matures and it becomes less volatile, then we will see pension funds coming in in, in larger sums. But at the moment, I don't know of any pension. I don't know if you're, you're, you're aware of any, but I'm not, I'm not aware of any pension funds that are buying Bitcoin uh, at the moment. Oh, I think Pampliano, Anthony Pampliano, he, I think he, you know, with his, what is this called? Um, I don't know what's his company called. I forgot, forget that. Um, but isn't some kind of pension fund of the police and fire department? It, I think, th yeah, they're taking care of, of their sort of assets. Um, yeah, something like that. Yeah. But it's, it's still marginal, you know, so, it, but it's taking place already, you know, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So, uh, yeah, if you want to get into a bit more of the article or well, it's up to you. Um, yeah, I want to know, how do you see like the, uh, the economy like evolving once like what what would be for you from your perspective like what what is uh um like a you know what is a critical adoption rate within the economy where you could would say okay this is then you know the this was, would be the preparation for the next phase into you know whatever medium of exchange settlement layer uh unit of account is that something like far off from your perspective yeah, I, I see. I see it. Just at the moment, I see Bitcoin as a store of value, or more of a speculative asset. Mm -hmm. So, uh, personally, it's it's so volatile. Money tends to be the most liquid good in an economy, and tends to be the good that, that is more stable in value. And and we can all agree that that's not that's not Bitcoin right now. And I don't think it's going to be Bitcoin in a while because it has so long to appreciate. It's so small, you know, it's only 200 billion, uh, odd 200 billion or so. Plus minus. So uh, it needs to grow so much in market cap uh, before it can become uh, a medium of account, let alone a, uh, sorry, uh, a medium of exchange, let alone a unit of account. So I would expect the, this uh, speculative kind of a price discovery, value discovery phase to, to go on for, for quite a few years until there's, a, there's enough adoption, let's say a uh, large percentage or maybe a, quite, quite a large percentage of the population owns some of it. And then, then we can expect its value to stabilize and then it will become a very liquid good, which it is not right now. It's not liquid at all. You know, if, if you want to buy, sell a large number of Bitcoins, you're going to make the price drop most, most probably. And, uh, and the opposite is also true. If you want to buy a large amount, then the price is going to shoot up. So, in order for it to be money, it needs to be the, the most liquid good, according to Menga. And I think it, it makes sense, even though Menga wrote so so uh, long ago. And and I think we still have a long way until until that happens. Uh, uh, and and it's a it's a great uh, yeah it's a great uh, great path you know it's a great journey until then. And I think it, it offers great opportunities for investors and, and traders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, you know, you probably read uh, Parker Lewis articles also his series yeah. uh, gradual yeah. and suddenly yeah, is that yeah. something you can I mean what are, what are your thoughts on on that process, you know, of like gradual and suddenly could it be like could it come suddenly like because of you know external factors macro geopolitical factors playing out. Yeah, well, yeah, it's an interesting thesis, but I don't think we're there yet. I think we're still quite far away. But, mm -hmm. but once there's a yeah, there's a critical mass that starts adopting it, then is where the expectations become important, like right? and, and the trust becomes very important. And uh, if uh, merchants start demanding they they be paid in Bitcoin, then then we're going to see like if people fleeing the fiat system and, and using Bitcoin for the day to day transactions. But I don't think we're there yet, because if you look at prices of commodities, of labor, of uh, factors of production, they're still relatively stable uh, until now, you know? So, so I, I would be looking at uh, prices of factors of production, such as commodities, if they start picking up and wages start picking up, and, and if we see uh, maybe inflation, uh, inflation-linked bonds 
that also start spiking up, then we're, we're facing a, a currency collapse. Then we can see the, the suddenly uh, part that uh, Parker alludes to. I think, but, but, but I'm not seeing that. I don't think we can see that yet. But it's something to keep our, our eyes peeled for, for sure. Yeah. The, how much is the, uh, I think Preston Pish once talked about the, the bond market. Is that like a hundred trillion market, the, the bond market? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's a, yeah, at least a hundred trillion. You don't yeah. see a risk like like you know what what if the bond market implodes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, I see it. I see a huge risk, a huge risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the thing is, if it if it implodes, well, let's say if it implodes, it's going to be it's going to look uh, like inflation. It's not going to. I don't think we're going to see it nominally collapse because the central banks are buying. They're, they're, uh, they're they have a, a, a bid that's a floor to the price. So we're not going to see yields go up substantially, at least, at least not for now, because they have they can print the limited money, you know, they can print limited limited reserves. The primary dealers, so you have these uh, banks. I mean, the U.S. and in Europe is the same mechanism. They are they have to buy if they have reserve reserves, they have to buy the treasury issuance. So um, so we, we we might not see it nominally. We might we might see bonds collapsing through inflation, which is the same thing in real terms. That their purchasing power is collapsing. Now, are we there yet? Not, not yet. We, we need to look at the spread between the tips, the treasury inflated bonds and the, the, no, the nominal bond. So if, if you have treasury inflated bonds, unless the Fed starts buying those too, but then we would be in a complete circus. I mean, this would be a shamble of, of an economy. So uh, and we should see the tips. And this is something that uh, Lacey Hunt uh, talks about and I learned from him and it was yeah, really insightful. We don't really see tips uh, going up substantially. We have seen a, them pick up a bit. They actually went down, uh, signaling uh, def deflation expectations after the COVID crisis or well, during the, the burst of the, the COVID crisis in March. But now, now they're picking up a bit, but we're not seeing a substantial pick, a substantial rise in, in, in inflated treasury, treasuries, uh, inflation-linked treasuries. So I would be looking at that, and, uh, and like I said, commodity prices. If those start shooting up, then we then we're looking at outright inflation, and then the central bank need, needs to intervene if it wants to preserve the value of the currency. And uh, in 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 the article, I argue that they're going to have uh, big trouble doing doing so successfully. So uh, I think that's that's how I'm currently thinking about uh, the the risks of the bond collapse and and of inflation. Mm -hmm. Excellent. What, what are your thoughts on gold, like Bitcoin in relation to gold? Or what do you think is a perception of people when they when we talk about like relative scarcity of gold, absolute scarcity of, of Bitcoin? Because, um, you know, uh, let's, let's just talk or let's just in general talk about, the you know, the, the, the fundamental properties, the different fundamental properties of Bitcoin and gold. Because there's it seems to be like gold bugs, highly intelligent gold bugs, you know, in, experts, Austrian economists, even they seem not to get it or they don't or maybe because they're biased or working for a gold you know company yeah. uh where do you see the fundamental differences in, in between gold and bitcoin yeah i mean uh, i think it's a generational uh, in, in in many ways it's a generational uh, shift or border bar barrier or however you want to call it um we, is that saying you can't teach an old dog new tricks isn't it and uh, i think <laughs> When you've been reading books about how great gold is and how it uh, has intrinsic value and is the best thing that ever happened to yeah. the mankind, then it's going to be really hard for you to change your mind. And I, I, funny enough, I was a gold bug until uh, not that long ago. But eventually I, I started reading on Bitcoin and, and then, you know, there's so many compelling arguments uh, for why Bitcoin is a superior alternative to gold. And I'm not saying that I don't think gold is going to collapse. Like, because maybe like a lot of these uh, investment institutions like pension funds, like investment funds, like we said before, they can't really buy Bitcoin. So they, they're, they're buying the second best uh, thing in town, you know, which is gold. And I, I reckon that's why it's going up. Uh, apart from this inertia, this uh, habit of buying gold as an inflation hedge or as, as a risk. But in the long run, I don't see gold uh, being a, a, like a key asset in, in the in the global kind of financial system. I reckon Bitcoin, like you said, because of its absolute scarcity, but also because of so many other things, you know, yeah. it's infinitely uh, divisible, it's digital. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
and you can't yeah. you can't transfer gold electronically <laughs> you know yeah. how you gonna, and how are you going to assay or verify the authenticity or the purity of the gold I mean, this is just so many factors right yeah and the arguments for gold and against bitcoin are really uh you know they're, they're really crap mediocre arguments like things like it doesn't have intrinsic value but we know the value is subjective as there is not there's not such thing as intrinsic value or it's not it's not tangible which is it which is actually its greatest virtue bitcoin not being tangible is what allows it to be sent on, uh, online you know and we can move through borders with it which is memorizing a bunch of words so uh when you think about it carefully i don't think there's a competition going on at all i, I i'm not really uh, that uh, interested in gold uh, yeah do you think i mean if i mean you're the austrian economist i read a little bit you know like uh Rothbard, Hayek. Uh, do you think all these Austrian economists would would how how would they like uh, think about Bitcoin? Wouldn't they like you know because there there was never like a money at that time with uh, you know uh, unlike gold you know which which they always say that it has an intrinsic value, industrial value or something like that, like it's physical, right? But but Bitcoin is like totally non physical. It's uh, do you think they they would have uh, they would have welcomed uh, Bitcoin, uh, yeah. such as uh, you know Mises, Hayek, or? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I would say Rothbard definitely would be a fa would be a fan, mm -hmm. as long as he wasn't too dogmatic about his previous views. Because Rothbard actually writes, he says the ideal money is the one with uh, absolute scarcity. Uh, we don't we want the best money is that one which we cannot increase its supply. Mm -hmm. So if he is uh, consistent with his views, then we should expect him to be buying sats every morning. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, Hayek, and Hayek with his sly roundabout, you know, that's this, this famous quote <laughs> yeah. of him, you know, we can't take the, the whatever, the control of the money or something like that out of the hands of government, but not at least not violently, but only with a sort of through a sly roundabout way. Isn't that what, what, what Hayek would have dreamt about? I'm, I'm always asking myself. Yeah, for sure. And Hayek, in my mind, he's, he's the brightest of them all. I mean, he's, he's my favorite for sure. And uh, when he actually, when he, he wrote before the Great Depression, he, he also held similar views. It was the Great Depression that made him change his mind. And he actually advocated for, for increasing the supply of money in the event of a banking crisis like what we had in 29. But, but then again, I think he, you know, he would actually understand that under a Bitcoin standard, we wouldn't have fractional reserve banking and we wouldn't really have banking crisis that would, that would need such a monetary expansion. And Hayek, Hayek was, a, was an advocate of deflation too. Like he, he thought that a growth deflation, so the deflation that comes from capitalism, from an entrepreneurship, increasing the amount of goods and services that we produce, that, that, that leads to deflation, that leads to us uh, buying more things for less money. And, and he was a big advocate of that. So I would, I would presume Hayek would favor Bitcoin, yeah, greatly. And uh, Menga, I would I would think so too. So I, th I think most Austrians would be would be in favour of it. It's, it's only the, the there is a line of Austrians and uh, latest uh, who are in favour of free banking and the gold standard. Some Austrians, and they they are you know they're quite vocal. They have been quite vocal against Bitcoin, and uh, it's kind of hard to understand. I think there's a degree of inconsistency there, which uh, I don't know. It's hard. It's, it, it would be interesting to to hear more debates. About why they mm -hmm. believe that the, the fixed money, money, the fixed uh, supplies is an economic problem. That would be really fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Gail, um, you know, I um, probably know that I'm working with some other Bitcoiners and people from the film, <laughs> uh, in uh, sort of f uh, film experience people, like on a, on a project. We want to do a film, and since you also mentioned Jeff Booth in your article. Uh, do you see like a few, uh, you've, you've probably you read probably Jeff Booth's book, right? Yeah. So, where do you how do you how do you see the, it like an like a civilization society evolve with a you know as as Jeff Booth says technology is deflationary you know principally right so do you see like um, how do you see a society evolving into such kind of you know monetary economical scientific technological evolution? Hmm. Well, I would say that we have experienced like such a high degree of innovation and technology has brought such an increase in living standards worldwide. I, I imagine that 
multiplied by I don't know ten or or a hundred because human ingenuity is is uh, great when it's allowed to work freely, and uh, if if we have a, a small estate, if we have uh, if we have a monetary system based on Bitcoin, which allows for deflation, which uh, enables economic calculation without interferences from central banks, without without bailouts, without bailing out the losers, you know, these big corporations who just have ties to government and, and they're eating away at our, at our scarce resources like labor, like, like goods, like commodities. And if, if that capital and those uh, factors of production are deployed towards endeavors that truly add value, and that can only be done if we don't have interferences from, from central banks and from governments, then I think we could, have, we could flourish as a society. Yeah, I think the, I don't know, Mars is not the limit, it's uh, way beyond Mars. So uh, I, I, see, I see deflation as a, as a key ingredient towards a prosperous future. And it's funny that so many economists cringe and they, they have such a you know, deep-rooted fear of, of deflation, of falling prices, which is probably the most ludicrous thing that, that personally I have ever encountered in academia. Because, I mean, come on, like, the arguments against deflation are just, they're terrible. They don't stand, they don't, they don't stand at all. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, I think Jeff Booth's book is great. I, I really like Philip Baggers. I don't know if, you've, if you have him on the show. He's a, so he's a, He's German, and he teaches um, Austrian economics at the Masters that I mentioned at the start of the interview in Madrid. And he has a book uh, called in, Def in Defense of Deflation. And it, it's great. It's a brilliant book, and it goes through deflation, with what causes deflation. So he mainly differentiates between growth deflation, which comes from us producing more things. So if we produce more apples, prices of apples go down. Etc. And then he mentions the credit deflation, and that's the that's the that's the problematic one because and it comes from our banking system, which is based on fractional reserve and maturity mismatching. And uh, yeah, if we, if we get rid of that, I think economic cycles that they, they wouldn't really happen. We would have uh, companies failing, but capital would be used would be allocated a lot more efficiently towards uh, right. endeavors that really add value to society. So we can expect the. A prosperous future yeah for sure right let me uh, ask you before we wrap up uh, this is really important because i had tito scable on together with jeff booth and tito scable you know is the founder of free private cities he actually has now his first official project in honduras w where do you see the role of the government i mean do you think don't you think that with bit with a bitcoin standard and you know the whole structures and surround with a truly free market with true capitalism with true you know protection of uh uh, of of uh, private property, property rights, liberty, health, you know, well-being, uh, a private contractual partner, you know, service provider uh, could do all these things that the government should be actually doing much more efficiently, cheaper. What is your position like? <laughs> like, could, could we like just get rid of, like, make, make our governments obsolete? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think uh, the state, the state is, uh, exists in order to ensure a set of rules that we agree on. But then again, who, who, how do we agree on them? So uh, the private cities initiative is a way to decentralize the stateship and to have rules that, that you agree with. And I think that's the future. So we should go towards smaller states where, you know, if you want to live in, a, in an anarchist society, in an anarcho-capitalist, or it wouldn't be anarchist because you would have some form of a state, I guess. A contract. Right. Right, right yeah, between the cool citizens contract. and you know private contractual partner. You could be a company. You could be a service provider. You know, I I, yeah. I do a I do, a, and then you you guarantee me you know, on contractual basis that you're gonna you know secure and and protect my my security, my well being, you know, my my property, you know, and I mean, it's never been done. We don't have capitalism anymore. This this is something you know we we talked about. You talked about deflation. You know, it's like so much indoctrination going on in the minds of people. I mean, who would mind? Who would object? To deflationary society where you pay less and less for better, more efficient, more innovative, technological, unimaginable, you know, technology services, whatever that is, you know, from robotics yeah. to energy to transportation systems. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think it would be great if we could have a decentralized states where you live with the, the rules that you agree with. We would need some way to deal with externalities and, you know, conflicts between different states. But, uh, it's a bright future, I think, politically too. Yeah, we could have a lot of innovation there. Um, it's going to be it's going to be interesting, but definitely, if if the monetary system changes, 
states are also going to have to change. So it's going to be great to see how how these uh, yeah where, where it takes us for sure. Awesome. Well, Gael, thank you so much. Uh, maybe we can repeat uh, some kind of discussion with you, and I'm, I'm, I'm imagining you know with with Stephanie, Ben, Emil, uh, yeah. or some other you know economists. So, sure. uh, where where can people find you? Any other info I missed? No, uh, they can find me on Twitter. It's Gael Sand Smith, uh, and uh, I'm happy to always happy to discuss and share ideas, and uh, probably be putting a few more articles out there. So yeah, it's great to it'll be great to hear from people. And thanks Keep for the amazing work. Thank you, Gael, for your time. All right, talk yeah. to you soon. Thanks. Bye. All right, so that was amazing. Uh, as usual, it's amazing knowledge. I didn't even know that there's, you know, uh, some people out there who are really doing uh, um, amazing, you know, Austin economics with, on masters, PhDs, whatever. So I think this should, I think it's gonna, we're gonna see like a, a new renaissance of Austin economists. So yeah, I, you know, I always, especially I wanted to talk about not only Bitcoin, but like how this future could look like on a, on a, on a Bitcoin standard or the hyper Bitcoinized world and deflationary, uh, you know, monetary economical society where, you know, we have, we have true freedom, true prosperity, abundance, uh, ingenuity, you know, as, as Gail said, so make sure you follow him, uh, uh, like, retweet, share, uh, Follow me on YouTube, on podcast platforms. Thank you so much for again for your for support. And if you want to contribute in any shape or form to our freedom project uh, with a working title, Human Life Rooted in Bitcoin, give me a DM or an email. And uh, whether it be graphics, music, f film experience, film production, post-production, or you want to fund it, sponsor it in any shape or form, let me know. Thank you so much again. I'll see you soon.